But Deborah, we had a question from Joseph um, in regards to slide five. Do you know any resource websites or something about places providing these hotspots? Oh, I don't because they're localized. Um, I would say that you really need to look at a local resource to find them. But the ones that I'm aware of are at community colleges. And so, Joseph, I would suggest that you get in touch with community colleges in your area and see if they are doing that or planning to do that. Uh, and if not, suggest to them that they might think about it, that it would be one way to continue reaching out um, to adult learners in all of their programs, not just English as a second language. Thank you, break. Deborah. Um, yes, and so we had a question um, from Rebecca in regards to DC. Um, do you see, would you think that uh, these type of things will come out from OSSE um, to the mayor or how will that be dispersed in the DC area? I would be happening through OSSE, you're right, Rebecca. And I know that the mayor's office is, uh, is on top of a lot of this stuff. I'm not sure exactly what they're doing right now. Um, but yes, it will, uh, like all of the adult ed uh, that happens in the district, it will come out through Aussie, through Michelle Johnson uh, and her office. So that would be the place to be in touch with to find out what's happening in the district. Thanks. One more question. Um, do you think that Digital Equity Act will um, resolve or solve any of the problems? <laughs> oh, I pray for that every day. Um, the Digital Equity Act is a, itself, the text of it is wonderful. Uh, it really, if, if what it puts forward is actually enacted and actually happens, people will have access, people all over the country will have access um, to online resources. And that would be a wonderful thing. The, there are several issues with it. Um, it is in a different form in the House than it is in the Senate. In the Senate, it's a standalone act uh, introduced, as I said, by Senator Patty Murray's office originally. Um, in the House, it has been rolled into a larger piece of legislation uh, and that's being spearheaded by Congressman Clyburn, uh, James Clyburn from South Carolina. And it's a larger uh, infrastructure bill that he was putting together. And I don't, I haven't chatted with his staff recently to find out where they are with that and whether they, uh, you know, everyone's gotten diverted by these big spending bills. And so the regular legislation that was in process uh, is is kind of hanging there. And in addition, there is the fact that Congress has not yet determined how they are going to move forward with remote uh, lawmaking. They don't currently have a way to introduce legislation on the floor in either the House or the Senate um, when they're not actually physically in Washington in session. The rules of both the House and the Senate specify that they must physically be there to introduce legislation. Um, and they're working on how they're going to handle that. They have, in case you saw the news this morning, they have a role model in the British Parliament, which is about to start meeting virtually. Um, so we'll see how that goes over on the other side of the pond. Uh, but until, until they resolve that issue of how to introduce and move on legislation, um, they're kind of stuck with what they can do. Um, passing these big spending bills is something they figured out a process for being able to do that. Um, but they they can't do any of the rest of it yet. So stay tuned on that. We'll have we'll provide updates as we have them and as they have them. Any other questions, Chelsea? Um, yeah, we have quite a few more questions. Um, would you like to take one more? Or? I can take. I've got until two o'clock. Okay. Um, <laughs> So we have a question, are private nonprofits eligible for these funding and this hardware, this software? Oh, the, um, the governor's emergency relief mm -hmm. fund? I, I, so. I think it, yes, I think they are designated, if your 
private entity, your program, is currently a recipient of OCTA funds, of federal funds through your state offices, then you're one of the, the qualified entities. If you're not currently an OCTA recipient, um, a, an AFLA, we owe a Title II recipient, then I'm not sure what the situation is and you would need to be in touch with your governor's office or with your state director to find out more. Thank you, Deborah. We have a really great question from Andrew. Um, does Deborah have any advice to reach adult participants with low or non-existent levels of digital literacy paired with very low levels of English proficiency, sometimes um, low L1 literacy levels? Mm. Yeah, that's the hardest group, isn't it? Um, in many ways, they're the most wonderful to work with. Um, but in this situation, it really is challenging to work with those folks. I do have a colleague who recently um, successfully introduced one of her learners to um, the Zoom platform. It was a complicated day. It took, uh, it was a one-on-one, -on -one. it was a phone tutoring situation. They, she uh, and her husband were on the phone with this person, this, the learner. Um, <clears throat> the husband was on the phone talking the learner through it. Um, and the and the wife was on the computer guiding the learner through the computer by making the uh, cursor move and things like that. And they succeeded in showing this woman how to use Zoom. Um, I haven't had an update on that. And I, I heard that story about two weeks ago and I haven't had an update to see how it's going. Um, but it is possible, but it's obviously that's kind of a high intensity situation. It's not a way to reach a whole bunch of folks. Um, I think, I, I wish I knew a good answer. Um, one thing that you could do, and I'm making this up off the top of my head, but if you have a big screen, like a drive-in movie theater almost, but something, something comparable, maybe the side of a wall of a building that you can project something on, and you can get people to drive to where you are, you can do some kind of a demonstration that way on the you know project your computer or particularly your cell phone remember that a lot of our adult learners their access is only through a smartphone um, show them how to navigate but it is very tricky particularly when they have low levels of literacy in the first language um, they're really relying on oral communication as you know um, so that's a challenging situation Thank you, Deborah. Um, another question that we have um, from another Deborah is uh, what about the devices needed to access the web? Many programs cannot be used on smartphones only. Is there any mm -hmm. funding for um, schools or adult ed to share devices? Yes, that's actually a use that the GEAR funds, the uh, emergency education funds could be used for. Uh, one of the specifically designated purposes is technology. And so whether that in, involves um, distributing tablets um, or distributing laptops that can be shared, um, <clears throat> that would be one of the uses for those funds. So there is a provision for that. Uh, if the, um, the act that's currently in development goes through, there would be more funds for that. But that's where the our two our two issues adult education and digital equity that's where they come together uh, is exactly in what you're talking about deborah the the ability to have the physical equipment you need to get online a lot of of teachers the creative work that i was talking about at the beginning of the uh, session that teachers are doing is designed for smartphones on purpose because uh, because of those limitations and so people are using um, platforms such as Kahoot, if you've ever heard of Kahoot, K-A-H-O-O-T, it's a quiz, um, an online quiz maker, and you can make the quiz that your students can take or your students can make quizzes, um, and you can set timers to give, let them compete with one another, and it's specifically designed for, lap, for uh, tablets and smartphones. Uh, it's easy to use on those, so that's the other, the other possibility is to simply um, get creative about what you can do with a smartphone. 
Um, thank you, Deborah. We had a question in regards to um, your own personal opinion. What is your view about distance testing by CASA? Distance testing by what? CASA. Oh, CASAs? Mm -hmm. I, you know, that's a, um, a hard question to respond to. Um, I think it, it's not just distance testing by CASAs, it's distance testing by anybody. Mm -hmm. um, there are challenges with distance testing. Um, the first one is making sure that the person you're testing really is the person you're testing. Um, Kelsey knows something about that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> that that's the first challenge. Uh, and then making sure that the person is completing a test that's really a test for them without using any um, assistance that you as the test administrator can't see or uh, aren't aware of. Um, <clears throat> so I actually, I am in favor uh, on the personal opinion side here, I am in favor of finding ways to do assessment uh, through distance learning because I think we have to. And I think it makes uh, program participation and measurement of progress accessible to a lot more people than a testing that requires being there in person. Um, <clears throat> but it has to be a kind of testing that works in the virtual environment. Just as your teaching has to change, your teaching approaches change when you start teaching online. They're not the same as they are when you're there in person. Um, testing has to have different approaches as well. Um, when you have a, an assessment that's a constructed response assessment, um, Best Plus is an example of that, um, <clears throat> where you ask the learner a question and the learner has to respond and the learner doesn't know in advance what the question is going to be, you have a better chance of actually evaluating the person's skills. Um, <clears throat> and that works for listening and speaking. It's much harder for reading and writing, a much more challenging situation for reading and writing. Um, the GED testing folks have been working on that and they have some insights on it. I think if you go to the GED testing website, um, I think they have some description of how they manage the security for their tests, their online tests, um, and probably the other high school equivalency providers do too, um, <clears throat> how they manage security for those online tests. Um, but those are the issues. Thank you, Deborah. And a colleague of mine, Katie, wanted to add that Cal's BEST team has written guidelines to allow BEST Plus 2.08 2.0 test administration via video conferencing as well. Mm -hmm. um, and we are working with programs on this. So, um, and if you have questions about using BEST Plus um, virtually, Katie is more than happy to talk to you and answer questions. Um, and her number is 202-355-1588. And um, we'll also I will um, provide her contact information in our follow-up e email as well about Best Plus 2.0 testing. Thank you, Katie. I did, Katie, I did put the uh, the link to that guidance. I saw it online, and I did put the link to it in the in the slides as well. So it's in there as well. Perfect. <clears throat> um, and then we had some really great uh, follow-up questions in regards to that, Deborah. It looks like we still have a few more minutes. Um, <laughs> Let me find it. We still have over 200 attendees. It's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we need to be willing to use more everyday platforms that folks are familiar with. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have um, recommendations on some of those platforms? Everyday platforms. Um, does that mean non-internet platforms or does it mean? I think internet platforms. This individual had recommended maybe Facebook Live. Ah, I see. Um, yeah, if, if, if folks are from, well, for one thing, assuming that people, if people have Facebook, if people are using Facebook, that doesn't mean that they know how to use Facebook Live. Um, so don't, there's a leap there, a cognitive leap that you have to make. Um, it's not as far, obviously, as going to something like Zoom, but um, 
but still, there's, it's not the, quite the same thing. And not everyone has Facebook. So using Facebook Live is a great option. Um, I would say using YouTube, having a YouTube channel is a better option. Far more people have access to YouTube. In fact, um, my colleague David Rosen has pointed out that the number one search engine used by most people is not Google, not Yahoo, it is YouTube because they find videos of how to, of the answers to whatever questions they're asking. So I would say YouTube would be uh, a much better platform for that. Um, <clears throat> but YouTube is limited in what you're able to do with it. Um, so the question there is what, you know, what are, how are you going to use that? Um, you, can do, you can do a presentation, uh, you can't do a lot of interaction. So how are you going to use it? It's the advantage of these more complex platforms, you know, a learning management system is that it allows for uh, chat rooms, it allows for forums, it allows for writing in wikis. Uh, there's a lot of a lot more potential for learners to interact with with the course, with what you're teaching, with those. Thank you, Deborah. Um, another great question that's about a question about distance um, learning and distance testing. Um, how would distance digital testing affect price per test, do you think, personally? I have no idea. <laughs> uh, you can ask Katie that question um, if you want to. Katie, who just just chimed in on the subject of Best Plus, uh, that's that's much more in her area. I I don't know. Um, you know, test providers have to stay in business, and so it's it's really hard to know how that how that financial system would work. Um, sorry, it's just not something I have an answer for. Absolutely, um, Katie. If you're willing, I'm going to unmute you, and maybe you can answer that. Let's see if this works. Put poor Katie on the spot. I know, Katie. How are you? <laughs> Did we get her? Ah, uh, it doesn't look like it. I can't, I don't hear her. Katie? Nope. Oh, Katie? Oh, doesn't look like we got Katie today. Sorry, I'm folks. So sorry <laughs> about that, folks. It's a, good, it's a good question. It's a va really valid question. I understand exactly where you're coming from in terms of programs and, and how you run them. Uh, it's just not something I have the answer for, but I'm sure mm -hmm. that Katie uh, will be able to provide an answer that she will post on the Cal website along with the slides for this presentation. Yes, um, and we'll also share contact information for our Best Plus um, be uh, right. folks. So. Mm -hmm. um, AEA at cal.org. So, um, Deborah, in regards to Blackboard, uh, Blackboard has an assessment tool. Mm -hmm. That allows so, video monitoring um, and other sources. Have you used Blackboard previously to do some um, of the online digital learning? I have used Blackboard. Um, I have not used it with with really low level English learners. Uh, I've used it mainly with higher level learners, and it works very well with them. Um, it's quite a complex platform. It has a lot of power, a lot of potential. And it's, and it's actually kind of fun to use once you get into it. Um, I'm not sure how I would use it for lower level learners. I'd really have to think about that because it is fairly complex. Um, you'd have to set it up to make it the screens very straightforward. Um, as far as using it for assessment, uh, when I used it for assessment, they were assessments that I wrote myself that were simply for my learners to judge their own progress. Uh, they weren't uh, high stakes, any kind of high stakes testing that you would do for something like the NRS, for example. Um, <clears throat> and I don't know what it would take for, this is another Katie question actually, and, and a question for Linda Taylor at CASAS. Um, I don't know what it would take to connect the existing tests that are approved by NRS. And remember, there are only a few tests that are actually approved for NRS reporting. Um, what it would take to connect those with the online platforms such as Blackboard or Sakai or Moodle or any of the other ones. Um, and, and you do have to have, if you're going to be reporting for federal funding purposes, you do have to be using one of the approved 
uh, assessments. Um, and uh, just to share, Angela also recommended Google Hangout as a potential um, mm -hmm. uh, synchronous component as well. Yes, um, if users are familiar with Google Hangouts, that's a good one. Um, Deborah, we have a question in regards to those who don't have like access whatsoever to internet. Um, mm -hmm. Have you heard of any ways that programs are reaching students without internet access, without cell phones, without, you know, are they using maybe radio or community mm -hmm. TV? Have you heard of anything? Yes, yes, and they are using radio and, and community TV. Um, and as I mentioned before, they're also putting together print packets of learning materials uh, that they distribute, uh, that they're mailing them or driving around and leaving them in mailboxes. Um, <clears throat> they're doing phone tutoring. Um, so there are a number of, you know, all the old fashioned ways that we used to use of reaching out before we had the internet, uh, <clears throat> but with the same challenges, you getting things to people and then having them have the chance to really work when they're at home, work on those materials uh, is pretty challenging for our learners, especially when their kids are all around all the time because they're not in school. Uh, it can be pretty challenging for folks, but there are ways to reach out. Um, and another thing that I've heard about that's happening, uh, I know in the K-12 arena is teachers are <laughs> getting in their cars and doing parades, teacher parades through their communities so that their students see them they you know they kind of drive around and they roll down the windows and wave out the car um, so that their learners know that that they're still there they're still thinking about them um, and i think that that would work for adult learners as well just to have them know that your program your teachers are there they still care haven't forgotten you i i've personally seen one of those parades and it's it's so nice the kids love them. I yeah, and that's a great idea for for um, maybe adult adults as well. Mm -hmm. um, piggybacking off of um, w what we're currently talking about, Michelle had a really good question of um, what what do you know um, what do you know in ha in regards to adult learning programming uh, and coordinating with local schools? Um, is there any poten potential for synergy between the K through 12 schools and ad adult education with some of these um, accessibility issues for this internet? Is such a great question. This is really a great question. Uh, I think a lot of people listening to this are aware that the, the way that adult education and the K-12 system interact is different state by state, depending on how your state handles the funding. Uh, some states handle their federal funding through the education department. Um, some handle it through the community college system, some through the Department of Labor. So it's kind of complex uh, and that will influence how you're able to proceed with that. But I am certain that uh, that there are opportunities there to connect and to, um, to bring together K-12 education and higher ed and adult education, uh, all to address this, this issue um, perhaps through the local community colleges as, as uh, an, an intermediary, but to address this. Um, I've met a number of K-12 teachers who are interested in one way or another in providing some kind of instruction, English instruction for the parents of their students, um, parents who have limited English skills themselves. Um, so I know that the door is open and the door is always certainly open on our side, the adult education side. Um, always interested in collaborations. So I would encourage you to to pursue that. Um, find out in your town or your city or your locality who's um, who's doing what and the K-12 system and go have um, a Zoom conference with them or a phone call with them and see how you can put something together. Uh, this The solutions to this are coming from the grassroots, much more than from the top down. They're coming from the grassroots. And we have an opportunity here to really make something happen for all of our learners from, from pre-K all the way through adult. Um, so I would encourage you to go ahead and do that. And uh, an individual within the chat has shared that she knows some programs that are doing um, proctoring 
from social distancing and parking lots as well. And mm -hmm. she seems mm -hmm. has, has worked out. Excellent. Thanks for sharing that. Um, ooh, good question, Darlene. Um, Darlene's asking, how are they documenting students' attendance when using maybe radio or television? You can't. Yeah. <laughs> And it's a great question, Darlene. Thank you for asking that. I, what you can do, what you have, is what the radio station knows about its audience size and, and its distribution, how far its signal reaches. Um, that's the only real data that you have, and same with TV. Um, the advantage of having something on YouTube is that you can count how many people have watched it. Um, <clears throat> with radio, you really don't know how many people are listening, and of course, there are those people who are listening but not listening. They have the radio on, but they're doing something else. Um, so it's very difficult to evaluate what's actually happening. You can't really count it as seat time. This is coming back to what I was talking about earlier with how do we evaluate uh, what's happening with distance education. It's one of the factors that we just aren't going to be able to get a handle on, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, Deborah, I, I believe the questions have uh, slowed down and um, it's almost about two. We've been on the line for a while now. I've really enjoyed all the wonderful, insightful questions we've had and your wonderful resources and responses. Mm -hmm. What an asset we have here, everyone. Thank you so much, Deborah, for joining us. Um, we will send out all of the slides from today and a recording of today's webinar. Um, it will be on our website and we'll send out a certificate of attendance as well um, via email as, as a follow-up. That's great. Kelsey, thank you for hosting us. Thanks to Cal for hosting this today and thank you all for participating.